I'm Michael Eager. I'm the local secretary of San Francisco Regional Mensa. I'll be your host today. Let me introduce today's speaker. Richard Litterer is a member of San Diego Mensa and a regular contributor to the Mensa Bulletin and the San Diego uh, Union Tribune. He's the author of over, over 40 books, including 50, English, 50 books now. Yeah, you uh, gotta get the bio from me, 50. Yeah, including Two. Anguished English and Adventures of a River War, both of which are on my bookshelf. He's also co-founder of the weekly radio program, Away With Words on NPR, and has been elected, or maybe that should be convicted, as International Punster <laughs> of the Year. Today's talk is fascinating facts about our president. Please, presidents, please welcome Richard Letterer. Great, thank you so much for having me and extending my own mission of teachership. I've been writing for more than a quarter of a century for the Mensa Bulletin, and I will tell you that Chip Talby is the best magazine editor I have ever had, ever. Uh, and uh, I think you can see the results of that in the magazine and how it continues uh, to improve. Uh, one of my favorite times of year is when I run the contest. It was puns last year in January and in poor uh, entries. And then we run it a couple of months later and there were four pages of Mensa puns uh, in that response. And speaking of puns, there's sort of an embedded pun, or three of them, in the word Mensa. Uh, mensa is uh, derives from an old Latin root uh, that means he who got beat up in junior high school. I happen to have played football then and in college and so on, so I never had that problem, but you know what I mean. But actually embedded is Mentis Mine, uh, Men's Month, M-E-N-S, and Mesa table. Simone and I live on uh, Mesa Madera, uh, basically wooden table drive. Um, so <clears throat> here we are. And what's fun with this, and when I write for the magazine, which is every issue, is it's just the perfect audience. Because Mensa, not where we get your jokes, and Mensa, where we get you. So each of us, through some combination, but at any rate, uh, we all have that uh, little mouse on the treadmill running around inside our skull. And uh, we just love that pit-a-pat-a, pit-a-pat-a, pit-a-pat of Mensa. Now we, and ours is recorded also, as this uh, is being recorded, uh, a couple of weekends ago in late September, celebrated the 60th anniversary of American Mensa, when four North American Mensons met in Brooklyn, uh, and uh, that was September 30th, 1960. Uh, and of course, we've got coming up in Houston next year, uh, in, in the uh, 75th anniversary of Mensa itself. And I'm sure most of us here will be there. That's a world gathering and just amazing. Okay, I just wanna start very briefly. Uh, I am the father, actually I said 50 books, it's now 52 of two bouncing baby books. Uh, and I'd love to do your holiday shopping with it. And that will feed in uh, to our scholarship fund here, which has been largely fueled uh, and funded by uh, a poker tournament that I run every month, but haven't been able to since February. Notice both ours in February, I pronounced. Uh, and these are $13 books and I give $8 back to um, our, our scholarship fund. So no, it would be for a good cause. These are for 12 and above. And um, there they are. And to give all you young folks some hope, I am 82. I am so old that when I was a boy, rainbows were in black and white and the Dead Sea was only sick. Uh, and my artist is 91. So that gives you some hope. They're about 100 pages each. Uh, if you know Richard Letterer, it's learning dressed up to have fun. You will find out all sorts of things about these holidays. Bet you didn't know that this is the 100th year anniversary of the 1920 first celebration in, in America of Halloween. Anoki, uh, Minnesota, 
Uh, they call themselves the Halloween capital of the world and uh, stuff like that. Christmas, well, just to take one example, if you've ever wondered why the narrator of the 12 days of Christmas, presumably female, uh, receives from the true love a partridge in a pear tree, not just a partridge, but an entire pear tree, seems kind of cumbersome. Uh, that's explained in the etymology section of the Christmas book, all of those linguistic tropes. I'll talk about that later. Uh, probably Halloween, unless you got an order in right away, it's too late, but Christmas still plenty of time. Uh, I'm going to center this on 10 to a dozen bar bets that you will win 80% of the time. And uh, you can take that money and use it to renew your Mensa membership next year or whatever, or maybe to snag a book or two, because I'd love to do your holiday shopping. I will sign and inscribe each one personally. So we go to the first bar bet. Here are our presidents of the United States from George Washington, uh, 1789, elected to his first term, to Donald Trump elected in 2016. By the way, uh, I will be, I have very strong political views, but you're not gonna know what they are. I will be completely nonpartisan. This is not an ethical platform for me uh, to uh, espouse my views. And I guess I'd prefer that you don't either. Now, if we get down to a small group at the end after, Ah, maybe so, uh, but not now. So Clarence Darrow, you know, the great attorney uh, for uh, the Scopes trial and so on in the 20s and 30s, once said, uh, when I was a boy, my parents told me that anybody can become president in the United States. Now that I've grown up, I'm beginning to believe it. And you will agree that Jefferson, our third president, I assume you see the pointer there, uh, was president. Uh, Nixon uh, was also president, and the, he is our only California native, and he's about an hour up the road on the five here, we say the, uh, from San Diego. <clears throat> and FDR successor Truman was president. My point, of course, is that any Tom, Dick, and Harry can be president of the United States. Uh, you may want to write these jokes down, and if necessary, if you ask me for them, I'll zap them to you. Uh, so the first bar, bar bet uh, is this. How many men have been president of the U.S. of A? I'm going to give you a chance uh, to come up uh, with an answer. How many men, and here they all are, have been president of the United States? Okay, I'm betting a lot of you said 45 because Donald John, Don Trump, Donald John Trump is indeed our 45th president, but he is only the 44th man to be president. Why? It has to do with this photo and that. They look like identical twins, but they're actually one guy, and that is Grover Cleveland. He became our 22nd president, ran for re-election, and won the popular vote, but lost the Electoral College to Benjamin Harrison. And uh, Benjamin Harrison, the grandson of William Henry Harrison, our ninth president, who served only 31 days and died of pneumonia. The only grandfather-grandson combination. Well, the very young bride of Grover Cleveland, married in the White House, um, said, don't move the furniture, we'll be back. Cleveland ran again, and this time he did secure the Electoral College as well as the popular vote. And the mathematicians, uh, unfortunately, counted him as both 22 and 24. And as a result, we're one off irremediably forever. So that's why it's 44. These are the same guy, these two. Okay, everybody with me. Now for a question that I would try only with Mensons. And the question is, can you name two, T-W-O, two American presidents, each of whom succeeded their successor or his successor? If you're really strong on that, that is the singular. What I'm saying is, can you name two presidents of the U.S.? One is pretty darn easy. 
each of whom succeeded his successor. Two. Now, if anybody knows that, you can, I don't know, Michael, they can raise a hand or do something in the chat room down below, although I don't see one there. But if anybody knows that, uh, but you have to get two, I, you, you can unmute you, uh, if they can and give me the answer. Can you name two presidents of the U.S. of A., each of whom succeeded his successor? All right, I don't see anything in the chat room. Michael, I, I don't see anything. We, we do have one person. Eric Peterson says, Cleveland and Harrison. Very good. And can Eric speak for, uh, uh, is he able to come in and speak? Yeah, if he just unmutes or it's a space bar, okay. he will be up. Eric, explain how we get both of them, although Cleveland is pretty easy. Eric, can you do that? Eric? All right, I'll do it. Um, so here's the answer. Clearly, Cleveland succeeded the man who succeeded him. So you will agree that Cleveland succeeded his successor. However, when you have A, B in this situation, and then you get A returning, A, B, A, immediately both of them, as Eric points out, uh, both of them succeeded their successor. Now, Cleveland succeeded Harrison. Was Harrison Cleveland's successor? Of course, because there's Cleveland. Harrison is the successor. So the second time around, Cleveland succeeded his successor. Anybody can become president of the United States. We've had very handsome presidents. We probably think first and foremost of Ronald Reagan, the only movie star who became president. Um, and uh, also the only labor leader we've had. He was president of SAG, Screen Actors Guild. And in fact, as a union leader, his first vote was for Franklin D. Roosevelt. And that's Roosevelt, meaning Rose Field. Uh, my wife is Dutch and she can attest to that, uh, but he voted for a Democrat. Um, Reagan uh, was in 54 films and met his future wife, Nancy Davis, on the set of Hellcats in the Navy, uh, and um, uh, and they were married later. He would have been in 55, but when he auditioned for a film called The Best Man about a presidential campaign, uh, the director uh, did not take him, uh, refused to take him because he felt Reagan didn't look presidential enough. Good looking guys, we think of Kennedy, uh, Harding, 100 years ago, 1920, elected uh, the first time that women could vote, and both men and women thought he looked handsome and very presidential, uh, and that was uh, very helpful uh, there. By the way, the vice president on the Democratic side was Franklin Roosevelt uh, with James Cox as president. A lot of people don't know FDR ran for president and lost a long time ago. Uh, Franklin Pierce, a good-looking guy, uh, Gerald Ford actually was a male model before he lost the hair and so on. As far as ugly, hands down, Abraham Lincoln. Um, and uh, a, a reporter, and back in those days, boy, could they write, a reporter for the New York Herald wrote this. Lincoln is the leanest, lankiest, most ungainly mass of legs, arms, and hatchet face ever strung upon a single frame. He has most unwarrantably abused the privilege, which all politicians have, of being of ugly. Isn't that marvelous? We'll get back to Lincoln there. Um, although part of that uh, is that he may have had Marfan syndrome, uh, and I'll talk about that later. I'm especially pleased, first of all, because you're fellow Mensons, and we know what we're all capable of giving each other. And let me just say here and now, if you ever want me back, I would come at the drop of a request. Uh, I can do anything from grammar. I was use, former usage editor of the Random House Dictionary of the English Language. Uh, I can do language comedy. Uh, if we have fun, uh, I'm yours. Uh, and uh, it's just as simple as that. And in terms of any charge, I'm good for nothing. Free and worth every penny, no problem. But I'm especially delighted to be with you during this time of electile dysfunction because we, the world's greatest democracy, 
we, with the world's shortest constitution that is a oldest and model of other constitutions, most recently uh, of Egypt, are woefully ignorant of our history. And in fact, recent NAEP surveys, National Association of Education, uh, 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 assessment of educational progress uh, that tests uh, extensively fourth, eighth, and twelfth graders indicates that history and civics are our worst subjects. One quarter of Americans say these uh, surveys uh, say that uh, Columbus discovered America after 1750. One third cannot identify the century in which the Revolutionary War was fought. And three quarters of respondents cannot, do not know the, the, the nation from which uh, we achieved our independence. You'd be amazed how many people do not know uh, the, the adversarial, two adversarial opponents in the Civil War and which one won it, ah, and so on. Uh, as George Santiana said, those who ignore or forget their history are doomed to repeat it. Uh, only 7% uh, can name the first four presidents of the United States in order, but hey, you're all Mensons, and I'll bet you can. Oops, sorry, I guess I put that chart up too fast. Uh, but let's look at that chart for a minute. Did you know that first seven of the first 10 American presidents were born in Virginia? Virginia known as uh, the birthplace of presidents. And actually eight of the first 12 because Zachary Taylor was also from Virginia, but from Washington to Tyler, seven of the uh, of them of the ten are Virginians. Two of the obvious exceptions are the Adamses, father and son, number two and number six, and then right after Andrew Jackson from the Carolinas, but everyone else there from Virginia. Notice that three, four, and five the Virginia dynasty, as they were called, do you see that they each served eight years in succession? Three, uh, two full terms, two and two. Uh, so um, there they are, <clears throat> eight, eight and eight, uh, and uh, is 24. And so from 1801, they're 24 years. It's happened only one other time. Here's your bar bet in American history. Can you identify the three presidents? Eight, eight, and eight. So that's not going to be FDR who served four, except he didn't get very much into the four, fourth one. But that's not eight and eight and eight. Uh, but can you identify three other American presidents who served 24 years, eight, eight, and eight? Now, two clues. One is that one term presidents are generally not well known. Two term presidents are pretty well known, and obviously each of these three was uh, uh, a, a two term president. Second, uh, Rich Letterer would not lay an impossible question on you. And uh, so you have to trust me on that. Uh, if anybody has that, you can unmute and give an answer. Uh, and if not, I will give you the answer. Anybody? Clinton or Bush, Obama? Yeah, who said, who is that? Carl. Carl, okay, Carl. And that is exactly right, meaning our presidents. Why did that go backwards? But there we go. Clinton, Bush, Obama, and you see eight, eight, and eight, our president. So I hope you'll agree that uh, that was a fair question because that certainly happened within uh, everybody's memory here. Only... Um, 25% of Americans can name the four presidents, their faces on Mount Rushmore. I'll bet you just about all of you can. And here we go. So Washington, Jefferson, uh, Theodore Roosevelt, who um, was president uh, during uh, the uh, undertaking of this project, and of course, Abraham Lincoln. Only 25% whereas 52% can name at least two members of the Simpsons family. 
and there they are. Homer, and I don't mean the fellow who, uh, well, he didn't actually write, but uh, created uh, the uh, Iliad and the Odyssey, Marge, and then slightly out of order, <coughs> Lisa, Maggie, and Bart. Bart, I'm sure the name was formed because if you reverse the R and the A in the middle, A and the R, you get brat. Uh, so there they are. Folks, I have never missed an episode or a Simpsons movie, just so you know. Uh, so I got that one pretty easily. Okay. Um, here's another bar bet. And here we go. What do these five people have in common? They, are all, they were all candidates for president, and two of them became president. The other three were candidates, as were uh, the, these. And what I mean is, um, uh, so Jackson and Cleveland became president. Can you tell me what they have in common besides all having been candidates? And again, if somebody wants to do that, uh, um, is it that they all uh, won the popular vote but lost the election? Yes. Was that Susan? That's Jackie. No. Oh, that's Jacqueline, J J Jackie Gentry. What a name. Fabulous. Okay, Jackie, that is correct. Uh, and that is, they each won the popular vote but lost the electoral college. So what happened was the Jackson, little known fact, actually lost an election before he then won uh, back to back. Uh, he lost to John Quincy Adams in uh, 1824, uh, won the popular vote, but lost the Electoral College. This fellow, I'm not sure I identified his picture till I set this one up, but Samuel J. Tilden, 1876, ran against Rutherford Bertrand Hayes won the popular vote. It was then taken, I think, to the Senate and uh, just such a corrupt election. Um, uh, ballot boxes uh, destroyed or manipulated, back rooms, smoke-filled rooms, deals made, and he lost the uh, Electoral College. And there was such anger that he had to have the inauguration indoors in the White House where there would have been a riot. Cleveland, I told you about, won the election, then lost the uh, uh, Electoral College, then came back and won. And these two, of course, we know, Al Gore, the Al Gore rhythm in 2000, uh, winning the uh, popular vote, but losing uh, the election in the Supreme Court. Uh, and Florida was the, uh, the key, key state there. And then finally, uh, Hillary Clinton, of course, in 2016, winning the popular vote by perhaps upward of 3,000, 2,000 of those in our state, incidentally, but losing the Electoral College. Now, here's the next question. Give me a chance to have a little uh, of this. H-I-J-K-L-M-N-O, that's H2O. I just went from H2O. And that is, what else did they have in common? And again, whether it be Jackie or any, anybody else, what else did these five have in common besides winning the popular vote but losing an election? They're all Democrats. That is correct. Who was that, Ed? Ed, yeah. Hey, way to go. <laughs> you could be in Mensa. Oh, well, you are. Ooh, and I think, gosh, hey, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think Gene Becker, who as a former chair, won some sort of award I was reading in the Mensa Bulletin. I hope I'm right, Ed. Yes, that's true. Yeah. Um, so there you go. And it ain't bragging if it's true, by the way. So there you go. What two presidents died on the same day, but you have to get all three to win this bar bet? What two American presidents died on the same day? What was the day and what was the year? And I wouldn't ask you the year unless it had some sort of, shall we say, decimal or commemorative importance. Would it, does anybody want to give it a try for all three? Not for two, not for one.
Okay, and Michael, uh, you don't see anybody. And listen, uh, you don't see anybody. Okay. Roberta hey, if, does have an answer, and so does Eric. Okay, well, I'll, I'll go with the first, because Eric, if it's the same guy, was on. And don't worry about being wrong, dear friends. What do you have to lose if you're wrong except your reputation and self-esteem among your fellow Mensons? Who cares about that? Okay, so this is, who is this, Curtis? Uh, Roberto, I think, was the first one to type Roberto. in. Roberto. Okay, Roberto, go ahead. Roberto? Unmute. Well, okay. right, that's not... So I put um, July 4th, uh, 1826. Boy, that's the hard one. And who are the two guys? Adams and Thomas Jefferson. Excellent. Right -o. And wasn't, wasn't they, they, they both knew that they were dying and Jefferson... Uh, You're stepping on my punchline, Roberta. Go ahead. You tell me <laughs> Go right ahead. Uh, that's very good. Brilliant. Yes, absolutely. So here we go. There they are. John Adams was vice president to George Washington uh, for his two terms. And then uh, he uh, <clears throat> and then he ran for his own presidency against Thomas Jefferson uh, and uh, he defeated Jefferson. And believe it or not, my friends, my fellow M's, in those days, in those days, the guy who came out second became vice president to the winner. Can you imagine a Donald Trump, Hillary Clinton administration, which is what it would have been, but ultimately partisanship uh, crept in and uh, they stopped doing that. They'd have a president and vice president running on the same ticket. Okay, so what happened is at the end of Adams's first term, Jefferson ran against him again at his own vice, his own president and defeated him. And that didn't sit all that well with Adams, but over time and distance and something that you'll all remember called letter writing, uh, they reconciled and came July 3rd, okay, 1826, one day before the 50th celebration of the signing of the Declaration of the Independence. Uh, Jefferson lay dying in Monticello, Virginia, uh, and um, on the 3rd, and as evening crept in, uh, he began to lose consciousness, and he asked his main confidant, Nicholas Trist, an attorney, um, and his grandson-in-law that is married to his granddaughter, uh, is it the glorious 4th of July? And to humor the old man, Trist said, yes, it is, grandfather. Jefferson lost consciousness, but lingered on alive, albeit barely, until July 4th, 1 p.m. Meanwhile, Adams, folks, John Adams at 90 years and eight months. This is a man born in 1735, three years after George Washington. 90 years and eight months, probably they used leeches then. They certainly didn't have the medical paraphernalia and miracle drugs that we have now. He lay dying in, um, Quincy, Massachusetts, and was conscious enough to see and hear the explosion of uh, the uh, celebratory fireworks, and uh, came about 7 p.m. that day, um, as John Adams was shuffling off his mortal coil and journeying to that undiscovered country from which no traveler returns, uh, if you didn't know it, I love doing Shakespeare. And actually, I might do Shakespeare at the um, late August uh, Houston uh, World Gathering. I might. I'm still thinking about that. Um, but he shuffled off his moral coil. And his last words were, and I'll bet you some of you know this, Jefferson survives. Actually, he had survived Je Jefferson. He, the older man. Uh, the lion in winter had uh, survived this lion in winter by six years. 
uh, just a few jokes to break things up. Uh, usually I'm more humorous than this, but the problem with this topic is if I get too humorous, it's going to get uh, politicized, and I don't do that here. Uh, so uh, I'm going to be a little less humorous than usual. Uh, the word politics, you know, how magnanimous uh, for Pia and Michael particularly uh, to uh, make this arrangement, I'm thrilled. Uh, magna large anima spirit. So an animated film, it's infused with spirit and it moves. Uh, and such a perspicacious group, Perry is through, Periscope and so on. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> uh, so spicacious, spic, spec actually, uh, two forms, meaning to see through into the heart of, of the matter. And that is what my fellow Mensons do. So how per perspicacious. So the point is, in my business of etymology, it's hard by the yard, but it's cinch by the inch. Divide and conquer. So you take the word politics. Let's start with poly, and we don't have to unmute here, but I'm guessing that most of you will say it means many, as in uh, polygamy, many wives, um, and uh, polyglot skill in many languages a polytheism, a worship of many gods. Uh, so polyglot, many languages. I'm sure you wonder how many I speak, right? I'll bet. I happen to be uh, fluent in French, Russian, Italian, Thousand Island, Vinaigrette, Ranch Gorgonzola, Green Goddess, Honey Mustard, and I'm working on balsamic even as we speak. And let me tell you, gang, good to see those mouths open, even though I can't hear you laugh. But um, I, I'm, I, uh, I also speak Esperanto like a native. And that might not work <laughs> with anybody else but Manson's. You know, just by some accident of genetic and environmental roulette, we just happen to have this thing. We test well, uh, we live longer, etc. You look at the studies of that. So, um, Here's an, another joke. What's the difference between a centaur and a senator? C-E-N-T-A-U-R and of course S-E-N-A-T-O-R. It's a lovely question because it's just the one syllable difference to the ear. So some of you, I hope you'll go back to your mythology book. Uh, it may have been Edith Hamilton mythology. It was white and you had uh, Hermes or Mercury kind of in a profile. Uh, and of course, if you know what a centaur is, you kind of get the joke already. Mensa, where we get your jokes. The difference between a centaur and a senator is that one is half man and half horse's ass, and the other is a creature in mythology. So there you go. Oh, I love it. Gosh, I actually see some mouths open, and I don't think it's to puke, but to laugh. Good. Okay, here's a little riddle for you. What do politicians and diapers have in common? And your answer has to be couched so that there is absolutely no word that could be offensive, no four letter word uh, that could be offensive to anyone here. And here's the answer. What do diapers and politicians have in common? They both need frequent changing and for the same reason. And you'll agree, I didn't offend anyone, right? Boy, Roberta and Jackie, I got to take you along with me when I get back and out and about because I am sort of the ultimate extrovert. Uh, and, uh, you know, I uh, just... It's interesting how much of your own energy you have to create and look up at that little hole up there, not even straight ahead and not at you to the right, my right at any rate. Uh, so it's very challenging. So there you go. I have more jokes, but I won't do them here. Okay. Um, who is our youngest president? This is a great bar bet. And uh, I suspect that two or three names will pop up. Okay, just giving you a chance. Kennedy? Uh, right, and, okay, that, that's from somebody? That was Carl again. Carl. 
Okay, you're finally wrong, Carl. I'd like to agree with you, but then we'd both be wrong. But you've been damn good on the ones before. Hoyer? Is that how you Carl, is it Hoyer? Is that how you pronounce your last name? It is, yes. Yeah. And of course, I have a German last name, Lederer, as in Lederhosen. And it means uh, leather maker. It's the German equivalent of Skinner and Tanner. A anybody else? It's not Kennedy. Okay, I love this. Yay! Little chance for education. So, John F. Kennedy, come on, 43 and seven months, good looking guy, great head of hair, attractive wife, two exceedingly young children for a president, and that is Caroline and John John. And you may not know that uh, a third was in the oven, and that was Patrick, uh, but uh, still born, alas, but, you know, everything. And you have to be 35, you know, to get in. But for, the average entering president is 54 and a half, and this guy was 43 and essentially a half, seven months. It's got to be Kennedy, but it isn't. It's the other guy. It's Roosevelt. Right. And so Roosevelt at 42 and 10 months, nine months younger. Boy, are you going to win these bar bets or embarrass your enemies or something like that? Uh, he uh, was uh, vice president uh, elected for the second term of William McKinley. He had been governor of New York, that is Roosevelt. And uh, very early on in the second term, McKinley was assassinated by um, a uh, disgruntled um, office holder who wanted to be ambassador to France and uh, at any rate was assassinated. And Teddy came in at 42 and 10 months and was so young that after his second term, he was still only 50 as an ex-president, which is the record. Here's the point. If I had said which president was elected at the youngest age, Kennedy would have been right. But all I said was, who was our youngest president? I don't think that's a terrible trick, but it does make the, it work or it wouldn't be very useful. TR, very innovative president. The first president, first of all, to be known by his initials, and interestingly that JFK, LBJ, after him, used that, uh, TR. Uh, the first uh, Nobel Prize, Peace Prize, I think that was for the uh, Sino-Russo-Russian whatever war. The first to uh, fly in an airplane. The first to leave the country during his presidency. Um, <clears throat> and he happened to travel to Panama and was very instrumental in that. And the first to invite an African-American family to the White House. It was the family of Booker T. Washington and uh, the uh, founder and first president of Tuskegee Institute uh, and ultimately uh, advisor to a number of Republican presidents, that is Booker T. And... Uh, leader of the conservative wing of the African-American community. Well, that didn't sit well with folks down South about 120 years ago. And to mend some political fences, Teddy went down to Smeeds, Mississippi, Smeeds, Mississippi, capital S-M-E-D-E-S, -E ostensibly to settle a border dispute between Mississippi and Louisiana. While he was there, his host uh, asked him, would you like to go hunting? And he said, sure, that would make him look good. And, you know, uh, in those days, everybody almost shot the game. I don't know if you know that uh, the buffalo in this country really bison, but we call them buffalo. They were the largest mammalian herds in the world and then were decimated by us. Um, and decimated doesn't mean one out of 10 either, if you, if you want to question me on that after. Because I will open up the floor, and of course you'll all fall through, uh, two questions on language, which I know better than history. History is a sideline. Language is who I am. So at any rate, um, what happened is he went out to the field, and his host captured a, a two-year-old bear cub, the guide roped it to a tree. They put 
uh, a shotgun rifle into the hands of the president and said, shoot the bear. Roosevelt turned away and said, I couldn't do that. If I did that, I couldn't look my four sons in the eye. And two days later, I think that was November 6th, 1902, this cartoon appeared. And you see the cute little bear, the guy uh, dragging it to a tree. You see T. Roosevelt with his anatomically incorrect left arm saying no, refusing. There's the rifle. <clears throat> and what you see is a caption that you can read drawing the line in Mississippi and a completely illegible uh, signature by the cartoonist Clifford Berryman. I don't know how you'd get that out of this, but that's his name. Drawing the line in Mississippi, a triple entendre and drawing the race line um, and uh, drawing the territorial boundaries. And then of course, drawing the line on animal cruelty. Well, this image or this cartoon went viral in the way something would uh, about 120 years ago. And the story now switches to the wilds of Brooklyn, New York, where a Russian immigrant couple, Rose and Morris, Mictum, M-I-C-H-D-O-M, rhymes with victim. Well, they ran a variety store and they sold tchotchkes, giggles, novelties, food, drink, um, jewelry, uh, uh, toys, and guess what? Stuffed animals. They wrote to the president, dear Mr. President, uh, we would like to manufacture a stuffed bear and name it after you and call it Teddy's Bear. Capital T-E-D apostrophe S, note the genitive, the genitive plural. Uh, and we ask your permission. Roosevelt wrote back, I don't know what my name will do for the bear business, but sure, go ahead. Woo, did it do a lot for the bear business. The man was humongous, ginormous. They had to hire an extra, um, a whole bunch of seamstresses. It led to the founding of the Ideal Toy Corporation, which lasted more than a century. In 1904, Roosevelt used this image for his election campaign. Remember, he was not elected president in the first one. So this was his first run at the presidency. Uh, and in 1906, Teddy's bear apostrophe S became enshrined in the dictionary and uh, has remained there ever since. But of course uh, has dropped the, uh, the inflection, the, the genitive there. Okay. Um, Clifford Berryman never got a cent for the use of the image, but he wrote, uh, I guess, in an article or his uh, autobiography, I have made thousands of children happy. That is enough for me. Again, my dear friends, if you need any of this, that story, uh, the story on OK, uh, which I'm not going to have time for, but I will be happy to send uh, to you. Absolutely my pleasure. Uh, to do that. Anything on language? Uh, gee, what's this bit with they as the third person singular? I thought it was a third person plural. What's that all about? Any of that stuff, it's what I do. Or if you were wondering which is correct, nine and seven is 15 or nine and seven are 15, just ask Rich and he'll give you the answer, which of course is 16. Okay, now that you know our youngest president. Okay, I'm seeing some mouths. Ah, Roberta, I have got to meet you one day. Um, the gift of laughter, you'll live longer too, trust me. Um, so at any rate, um, our oldest president. Now there are two ways to posit that, to set that. And we're gonna go first with our oldest president in terms of length of life. What president has lived the longest and again, uh, Michael, you're doing a great job with it. Uh, and that is uh, if uh, anybody wants to answer, you can unmute them. Our oldest president, that is biblically the fullest of years. Tom, Jimmy Carter. Uh, I didn't quite hear that. I Who think Vikram uh, said uh, Jimmy Carter. Okay, anybody else? Very good, and that is the answer. So here's what happened. Um, 
and that is uh that let me just check this please i may have to take it back yeah uh okay for 175 years john adams as i mentioned a man born in 1735 and lived till 90 years and eight months for 175 years he was our longest live president no long eye not lived live he died at 93 and four months was succeeded not long after in terms of fullness of years by gerald ford who lived a month and a half longer by the way not exactly a bar bet but this guy uh clearly our greatest presidential athlete uh had a, a, a played for michigan and was uh, offered to play uh, for the green bay packers um <clears throat> so he succeeded by he is our only president born a king because he was leslie lynch king when he was born and when his mother divorced and remarried, he took on his stepfather, new stepfather's name in full, Gerald Rudolph Ford. So those two, then they were succeeded by George H.W. Bush. Uh, both Carter and Bush uh, were born in 1924. And, uh, but then when H.W. passed on, uh, shuffled off his mortal coil, it was indeed this gentleman who uh, is now our longest live president well into 95, despite the brain cancer, which he seems to have overcome. And there you go. The way to do that is you become president for one term fairly young, and then you live a very long life. He, he just turned been, 96. Oh, he did turn 96. Okay. Um, ooh, is that right? Uh, let me see. Where's his birthday? Where do I have it? I'll take your word for it. Um, you're right. That's right. In October 1st, he just turned 96. Thank you. I'll make sure to have that for the next one. Um, but the other way to do this is who is the oldest man to enter the Oval Office uh, for a reason other than stealing a pen? So uh, who was our oldest man to enter the office? And again, Michael, you're doing a great yeah, job. I believe as Lynn has an answer. Cle Cleveland, did you say? L Lynn has an answer. Okay, and Lynn. So Lynn? You can unmute yourself. Lynn? Well, I, actually, it's me, but that's, uh, it's, yeah, no, it's uh, Reagan. Okay, thank you. Um, Reagan, uh, uh, broke the record of William Henry Harrison, who was 68 and something. Uh, and Reagan entered the, uh, the Oval Office at 69 years, 11 months and two weeks, just on the cusp of 70 and more remarkably served for eight years and left office two weeks short of 78. Remarkable because until then, no, uh, the only president who was 70 in office at all during the term or terms was Dwight David Eisenhower. And he, that was only the last 10 months of his. But it is not Reagan. Anybody else want to try? Oh, I love this. This is great. Okay. Uh, Michael, nobody else is indicating? Well, I, I think it's Donald Trump. It is Donald Trump, yes. Here is, he turned in June 70. I know, hard to believe given the vigor of the man, but he turned 70 uh, in June and therefore was 70 and, you know, uh, I mean, uh, and about seven or eight months uh, when he entered the Oval Office. And I think the point here is, Modern medicine, it's quite modern, and one of its hallmarks is longevity. And I'm sure you can see that in your chapter as we see it here. Um, and we not only live longer, uh, but we live more cognizant, richer lives. And I think that trend will continue. So there is, all right. And my favorite of my bar bet questions, but if you heard me ask it before, Susan, <clears throat> Uh, you, you can't answer. Um, okay. Uh, can you name five presidents of the United States 
who are not buried in or on American soil, in or on US soil. Five presidents of the United States, not buried in or on American soil. And uh, again, Michael, if somebody's there, great. If not, I'll give the answer. Well, Trump and Obama and uh, the other three living presidents, I think would be those five. Correct. And that is correct. So going the other way, it would be Carter, uh, Clinton, <clears throat> uh, Bush, Obama, and Trump. You would agree they're all American presidents? Are they buried in or on American soil? No, they're not. The reason I say in or on is some of you will remember back to You Bet Your Life and Groucho Marx, Down Comes the Duck, the quiz show. And uh, if you didn't win for, say the word for Down Comes the Duck and you didn't answer any of the questions, Groucho for $50 to each member of the random couple would say who's buried in Grant's tomb? They would say Grant, fifty bucks for each, and I would sit there going, "It's not. You messed up." For one thing, Julia Dent Grant, uh, Ulysses's wife, joined him twelve years later in the site, and second, in a tomb you're not buried; you're above ground. So, just think of all that. Those hundred dollars. To think of all the uh, interest that it did uh, accrue. Wow. Um, okay, so Can I bring up uh, an exception to that because uh, when John Tyler was buried, he didn't consider himself to be in the United States. That and neither did the United States, right? Because he was uh, definitely um, a Confederate supporter um, and so, considered a traitor. Yes, yeah. Part of it is he had fifteen children. I don't know if you know, but but um, at any rate. Still, uh, that that wouldn't be part of, of, of this question. Yeah, uh, so his president was initially um, William Henry Harrison, and on the coldest day to that point, uh, March 4th is when they used to have inaugurations, uh, he, uh, Harrison, 68 years old, did not wear a coat, was just, you know, speaking. Cold rain, died of pneumonia 31 days later, uh, the father of 10 children with one wife. Tyler came in, they were both from the same county in Virginia. Wow, president and vice president. And Tyler had eight children with his first wife, she passed away, and then seven with his much younger second wife. 25 children from one ticket. What is in the water in that county? And the interesting thing is, that until recently, this man born during the administration of George Washington, I think it was 1797, had a two living grandsons in the estate in Virginia. Grandsons, I didn't say great grandsons. It's like 1797, and until about two months ago, two sons, brothers, alive, one of them has died, and the other in his 95 or something, the other is still alive from that man born in 1797. However, that bar bet you're going to clean up on. What do you say? Okay, as I move to an end, and I have to skip a lot, but the good news is you can find all this in my book. I'll show you a cover later called Presidential Trivia. So um, who is our oldest, easy, uh, sorry, tallest, easy question, Tallest, shortest, hard question, and um, shortest and uh, fattest president, medium question. Okay, uh, I'm, I'm just going to show you so that I don't go very much over time. There's just so much material, and uh, you all have very good uh, attention spans. So there, the, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I meant to say Joe Biden, if he is elected, and again, no partisanship here, uh, he will uh, exceed, uh, he will be, I think, when he comes into office, 78. And again, very vigorous like Trump. So here is the gang. 
six foot four at a time, that's Lincoln, at a time where the average Civil War soldier was five, six. As I said, possible Marfan syndrome, I think I said, preternatural height, size of hands and feet, sallow complexion, exaggerated uh, cheekbones, that's all Lincoln, but we have no proof uh, genetically that he was. Um, our shortest five foot four, James Madison and a hundred pounds. Uh, Washington Irving, uh, our first professional American writer, uh, Ichabod Crane, Sleepy Hollow, Headless Horseman, all of that, um, <clears throat> called him a, a, a withered uh, little apple john, but another observer noted that he had never seen uh, so much mind crammed into so little matter. And uh, it turns out that he is probably our only president who weighed less than his IQ. Uh, he was a hundred pounds and uh, he, uh, and this is reverse engineering, 141 IQ uh, are, again, you're extrapolating, so not reliable. But the two highest IQs, reputedly Thomas Jefferson, 153, and John Quincy Adam, 168. Quite suspect. Uh, and incidentally, today, for those of you who get Parade Magazine, you know, with a little red rectangle on the top as a supplement, uh, you will find uh, that Marilyn Vaux Savant has run a little uh, teaser for me there. Uh, we're sort of distant buddies. She's a New York manson, highest IQ ever tested, although she was 10 years old and they are notoriously unreliable. Uh, whereas mine is very reliable. I want you all to know I got a perfect hundred on my IQ test. I'm very proud of it. So darn it, that woman who laughed so well, she's not on there anymore, darn it. I love to see that laugh. McGuire, I think. So what? Here we go. Um, so at any rate, uh, he, the father of the Constitution, uh, despite his um, compactness, shall we say, uh, married um, Dolly Madison, and she was the belle of the ball, uh, the queen of the social scene in D.C. Uh, for decades. By the way, she was the one that during the torching of Washington, during the War of 1812, rescued the Gilbert Stuart Washington portrait. Uh, and I think that's the only original artifact from the original White House. Uh, but she wore exotic clothing and turbans and swags and scarves and just the bell of the ball. Our fattest, as you can see, William Howard Taft. Six feet and during his presidency, 300 to 340 pounds but still described as a um, graceful tennis player and dancer. He dropped 80 pounds after, the, after his term uh, and kept it off. And that was incidentally the election of 1912 where Woodrow Wilson against Taft, Republican against Democrat, and Theodore Roosevelt decides that he wants to be president again, comes back in, tries to, but fails to secure the Republican nomination, which goes to Taft. He runs as a third party candidate for the Bull Moose Party, nothing tougher than a Bull Moose, and splits the Republican vote. It ends up 48% for Wilson, 28% for Roosevelt, and 21% for the sitting president, Taft, the incumbent, now recumbent. Um, and uh, so the, uh, the best um, uh, set of numbers for a third party candidate, and that is Roosevelt, and unfortunate numbers for William Howard Taft, but in good humor, he said, I have just been elected ex-president by the largest majority in history. And he goes on, to be appointed Chief Justice of the Supreme Court by Warren Gamaliel Harding, and therefore becomes the only man ever to head up two of the three branches of government, 
obviously executive and judicial, and you can't really head up, it's impossible to head up the legislative because of the bicameral nature of our government. So um, uh, he clearly will have the record, I think, forever, but who knows? Nobody can exceed him at any rate. Um, okay, and so on. Okay, um, what I want to do is to, um, here are our presidents. I want to just point out one pattern, and I want to close with the bar bet. Okay. What Menson, what current member of our um, band of brothers and sisters, okay, has a child who was fired on national television by a president of the U.S.? And Michael, you can open that up again, folks, if what? you heard yeah. me do this before. Yeah. No. Okay, it, it's you, Richard. Yeah, and who is that? It's uh, Annie Duke. No, he's no, no. I'm sorry. Who is that? Oh, I forgot her name. Ed yep. Brecker. Yeah, and yeah. you are absolutely right. So what happened is in 2009, my daughter Annie Duke, the winningest woman in poker history, by the way, has a book out this month. That's not the first time that Daddy and daughter have had books out. Uh, I have two daughters. Uh, her, her sister, Katie, is a regular writer for the New York Times uh, and the New Yorker. Uh, we have no idea where they learned how to write, but just somehow it just um, emerged, you know, full blown from the head of Zeus. But at any rate, uh, she was then the winningest woman in poker history and went on Celebrity Apprentice um, in the second year where it was Celebrity Apprentice got to the finals, 14, you know, they get 16 contestants, 14 were fired, um, including the American ambassador to North Korea, bet you didn't know that, on that show, Dennis Rodman. And uh, then um, uh, it got down to Andy Duke versus Joan Rivers and Donald, uh, Donald Trump fired my daughter uh, there I was in the audience, uh, and uh, so the answer is, moi, um, it was I. I want to just point out one pattern, and then uh, we're just going to do this stuff at the end, and uh, I will stay till the last dog is hung, uh, and yes, I can do that one too. Uh, etymology, phrase origins, love it. Okay. A pattern that is not often noticed is that for the past 123 years, that's a lot of years, the party in power in the Oval Office, in the presidency, stays in power for multiple terms. Sometimes it's the man, and that's all it's been is XX chrome, XY chromosome so far. Sometimes it's the man himself most notably FDR, but the important thing here is it is the party. And we're coming up on an election that is going to uh, test that. So again, you can see, I, I, and tell me if you can't, but my um, cursor and McKinley, Republican, uh, gets to a second term, although you can't tell from that, is assassinated. Roosevelt, his vice president succeeds him and then Taft. So that is, do the math here, 1893 to 1913. That's four terms of Republicans, three different guys. Then, as I said, Roosevelt split the Republican vote. Wilson for two terms, see, two terms happens to be the same guy. Then all Republicans, Harding, Coolidge, and Hoover, and you'll notice that's 12 years, meaning three terms, Harding, Coolidge, and Hoover, 12 years. Succeeded then by a Democrat for four terms. Truman finishes the term, gets his own. And so there is your record, obviously, 20 years. Two terms Republican, two terms Democrat, Kennedy and Johnson, do the math, see, eight years. Nixon and Ford, eight years. 
And here's the exception, Jimmy Carter. One term, but equally as important for the pattern, preceded by a, Demo a Republican and succeeded by a Republican. So you see this is only four years of Democrats. Then Reagan and Bush, you might say, well, but Rich, uh, George H.W. served only one term. Yeah, but after two, a two-term Republican, and hence 12 years, uh, you see 12 years there. So that's three terms of Republicans, two, 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 as you know. And now, if Trump does gain, uh, is reelected, that would be uh, th that would be uh, the pattern. If he is not reelected, then he would join Carter as a one-term president, um, and and uh, surrounded by the other party. I thought you'd be interested in that. Thanks to my wife and my mixed doubles partner for putting the slides together. I married Simone for tech support uh, and many other fine qualities, but I'm too word struck, word besotted, word be thumped, wordaholic uh, to see space. I, I don't quite see the world the way it is because the darn words are just dancing around in front of me. Um, if you would like uh, some more about this, this is a $10 book plus $2 shipping of mine. Uh, and you see, I was the first, I designed this cover, Washington. I beat my president, that's the tough one, but Jefferson did indeed uh, defeat his own president, Adams. I was the youngest, as you know, uh, and that is uh, T. Roosevelt. Uh, and uh, actually he was president when this project was started. And of course I was the tallest. So once again, um, please think about these books. Uh, I'd love to do your holiday shopping. On request, I will inscribe and sign. I love doing that. An author adores to inscribe and sign. A, because it means more to the recipient and B, the recipient can't give it away to someone else. And there are 50 plus of this man's drawings, black and white, uh, in each book. Uh, and they're, they're magnificent, 91 years old. <clears throat> and it's about a third information um gee why does uh the clement clark moore 1822 poem uh end with happy christmas to all and to all a good night i heard him exclaim as he drove out of sight happy christmas to all and to all a good night but we say merry christmas well you're going to find out of what how a fellow named charles dickens and a book named a christmas carol influenced that so all sorts of things uh that you can learn so please, if you would, if you have any interest in any of my books, uh, there I am. This is always uh, at the bottom of my URL of uh, my uh, articles, columns in the uh, bulletin. And uh, just don't forget the H. And you can also order through my website. Uh, you can order, do PayPal through this. Um, <clears throat> and you can order through my website. If you have any trouble, send me a question. What can I do? Uh, just send that to me. So thank you. And Michael, what I'm wondering now, can you do it is we're done with this and can we get back for questions and fellowship uh, to, uh, can you take me off the screen and get back to uh, just the people? Can you do that? Stop share. I'm going to go stop share. That should do it, right? God, I hope this doesn't mess up. Yeah, good. Okay. Oh, thank you. Yeah, as the uh, mayor of uh, Manchester, New Hampshire, I taught at a church boarding school, uh, said uh, French Canadian, uh, as so many of the citizens were, were there. Thank you for giving me the clap. Uh, I appreciate it. But I'd love to get to know you. Look, we're not going to pass each other's way again, even if your group decides to have me back, where I will, uh, if I do the comedy, I, it will be funnier. And I forget um, if Betty, Betty, were you at the, uh, at the um, Charlotte, when I did the comedy act, were you on that one? Yeah. Uh, 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 that, what was it? An evening of language and laughter. Right. Yeah. Oh. And. Almost two hours people were hanging around. 
Uh, yeah, I'm before sure we get I too can... far too far into uh, open comments, I want to thank Richard Letterer for being our speaker today and uh, give him a thank round you. of over Bernie, uh, you're there. virtual <laughs> applause. Um, and we'll stop recording at this point and yeah. uh, we can stay around for for uh, comments, for open conversation. Anybody, uh, any questions about language, any questions about writing, uh, I will tell you after 50 books, uh, the two that I mentioned uh, are self-published. And the reason for that is you cannot really, unless you are a towering celebrity, and I'm far from it, uh, you cannot sell seasonal books uh, to brick and mortar publishers. So I have learned a lot about uh, self-publishing, anything like that, or you're doing your memoir, the kids don't give a crap, but the grandkids do. Uh, what about that? Uh, helpful there. Uh, obviously, uh, I can do grammar, punctuation, uh, literature. Gee, uh, one of the columns I have coming up uh, next year for the bulletin, but in the first part of the year is, well, really, who wrote Shakespeare? Who really wrote uh, the 154 sonnets in the approximately 37 um, plays? Was it that guy from um, Stratford or whatever? Anything like that, my pleasure. And if I don't know, we'll move on to something else. So anybody have a um, question for me? Rich, I just want to mention you you didn't finish the explanation of the origin of the world politics. You Damn got it. a little off track. Again. Yeah, you got yeah, to I did that again. All right. and all no, that. You're, you're right, you're right, you're right. Yeah, thank, thank you. It's a good one, so it's worth bringing Damn it, you know, when I made a mistake back in 1998, too, it really gets to me. <laughs> Thank you, Betty, so much. Sure. Uh, uh, yes, Polly, we all know, means many. Mm -hmm. and, right, oh yeah, you're right, and that's where I stopped. And so Polly means many and ticks are blood-sucking parasites. So <laughs> th that's politics. <laughs> Thank you. And many more. And, and of course, I'm delighted to send you stuff if you're specific. Uh, I'm, I'm very happy to do that. Um, hey, Richard, it's your friend Wynn up in San Francisco. Oh, Hi. boy. Wynn. Yes. And <laughs> so, hey, this um, guy, uh, you've seen a couple of his pieces on brainwaves. And I, I, I don't know if the word is subscribed, but I read that every week. Um, Mr. Mensa, MC, and an amazing uh, virtual, I don't know about virtuous, Wynn, but virtual, <laughs> uh, but virtual, <laughs> Wow. Uh, uh, show uh, that I don't want to steal your thunder and I can do that one too, but raise more <laughs> money than the live ones. And uh, and then, of course, I think maybe two or three Mensa bulletins you were in the back on um, whatever that thing is called there. Um, so, yes, uh, if there are questions, sir. Yes, yes. So I, I want to echo Michael's comments. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your Sunday afternoon with with all of us nerds walking us through. Okay, quick comment. Presidential. Quick comment, sorry. Nerd, believe it or not, that's a San Diego thing. Dr. Seuss, you know, the guy, I meant what I said and I said what I meant and the elephant's faithful 100%, wrote a lot of his stuff in anapestic tetrameter, but he didn't make it up. It was the night before Christmas and all through the house, not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. See, four anapest. First print appearance win of NERD, um, If I Ran the Zoo, 1950, Dr. Seuss. Because with authors, you often can really, you know, pinpoint uh, the first mm -hmm. uh, appearance, and it's that. Mm -hmm. So please. Um, thank you for that. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. What was the phrase that he used it in? Uh, I could send that to you, Betty. Okay. Uh, it's in I'm curious. I'm a big Dr. Seuss fan, so. It, but, it was it was the oh, name of one of the uh, one of the animals in the zoo, right. I believe. Oh, okay. That is correct, Carl. That's and good the enough. idea was, oh, if I ran the zoo, here's the ones we would have. You okay. know. Thanks, Carl. Uh, and, and actually, that creature doesn't look like a nerd, but nonetheless, <laughs> it was the first appearance of any R.D. I love it. 
Um, so going off of also Betty's comments about bringing up the politics joke. So obviously recently we're coming into a lot of discussions in the political landscape. And sometimes those discussions can get pretty heated. So my yep. question to you, Richard, is what are your go-to jokes or riddles or limericks or something to lighten the mood in some of those conversations if we ever need to? What are something, some quick things that we can just like insert into a conversation just to lighten the mood? Wow. And you don't mean political though, right? Uh, when uh, you just so mean- sort of it, yeah. In the similar vein, like if we're having a political political conversation, is there something quick we can just like interject with just to get some laughs and and to maybe not speak so intensely? Well, uh, I think I'm, I'm seeing a lot of. I think the ones, and I'll be happy to say them. The politics, they're not against a particular party, right? You know, uh, but they're humorous. Uh, you know, at blood sucking parasites or the difference between a centaur and a senator. Um, and that's about the best I could do here. I'd have to think for a while, but good question. And you're saying you wish we had more lightness uh, because yes. it has been a bit dark and divisive. That's the pronunciation, divisive, short eye there. Uh, and I, I understand it. I guess my question is going to be, what are so many of us going to do with the extra 10 hours of time that that till recently we've been watching television and now uh depending on the outcome but maybe not depending on the outcome what are we going to do with all that time uh so that's one and hey i'll just throw in uh when uh, to stay current but not political and i of course have an entire collection of these but covid 19 jokes okay you know, understand we get the 19, that's the average number of pounds that typically we stay at homes um, put on because uh, we, we don't get out. Um, and uh, you may notice, see, look at this. That's a tan that I got from the light in my refrigerator, by the way. Uh, um, but two of my favorites are, so with Simone and me, uh, we got a text uh, last night from our cleaning lady. Uh, she's working from home. Uh, but she did promise to send us instructions on uh, what we need to do. And a six-parter, you may have heard the first three, but I don't think you've heard the second three. So 20 years ago, we had, uh, uh, 20 years ago, Steve Jobs was alive, Johnny Cash was alive, and Bob Hope was alive. Now we have jo no jobs, no cash, no hope. Let us pray mightily that Meatloaf, Kevin Bacon, and John Hamm do not die. <laughs> Good. And of course, I have a ton of others, but um, there you go. Some more. I love it. And, and just, you know, anything, life itself, whatever. Um, I I'd like 80... to hear one on electile dysfunction. Yes, that's a nice pun, and you can use that there. That's what's called a double sound pun. I will tell you, my friends, at 82, I've still got two more books in the hopper. I get an F in retirement. Not that it's wrong to retire. It just doesn't suit me. Uh, I have eight Zooms this week, none of them by popular self-request. They're all from other Mensa groups uh, and uh, adult education. Uh, and um, San Diego Press Club coming up and so on. And I will do this uh, until I no longer can. So my goal in life, and it came pretty early, is to blow up the distance between who I am and what I do. And when, I, when that happened, which was pretty early, it really gave me that energy. This is why I was put on this planet. Uh, and the same with my kids. I was teaching at an Episcopal church boarding school and they came to me and said, dad, uh, 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 <clears throat> uh, we want to become professional poker players. And here I am teaching at a religious school. And you can imagine my reaction, which was quite simply, oh, fraptious day, kalu kale, I chortle in my joy. By the way, that is from Through the Looking Glass 
and will be the theme of our RG. And I know some of you have come. Simone will be program chair I in uh, yeah in <laughs> um, Memorial Weekend. We hope. We hope. Uh, and uh, that will be the 150th anniversary of that second of those uh, life-changing books by uh, Lewis Carroll. So I just said, hey, sounds great. Uh, I knew they were very good at games and um, they've ended up er earning $11.5 million. Uh, she, at one point, the winningest woman in poker history. And I just said, I hope like your dad, you just obliterate that distance between who you are and what you do and they have. So it was a good, you know, rather than, are you kidding? I'm going to disinherit you. I would have never thought of that. So just a little bit of a life uh, story there. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, since there's a pregnant pause, let me just tell you one other thing. You lose all the points in life you don't play. So I'm going to tell you how I met my dear wife, Simone. Um, I just Zoomed with New Hampshire Mensa, uh, just the middle of the week. And um, I was teaching in Concord, New Hampshire, and um, a head of the English department did a lot of coaching. I did a lot of sports in, in college. And um, the president of New Hampshire Mensa, Marty Kapanice, said, Rich, we're going to have a first, uh, what we call regional gathering with Mensa. We'd uh, love you to come and entertain us and edify us. And I said, sure. I was not a Mensa. So I go down there with my girlfriend, my mixed doubles partner, and we're still dear, dear friends. Uh, and um, we go in and very early on, it was clear she was not having a good time. And that was about the only issue that we had. There was that gap of that kind of thing. I think you know what I mean. And uh, I was having a great time. I said, wow, these people, they're terrific. Uh, I think I knew them my whole life, but I've just met them today. And um, I uh, <clears throat> do my talk. And there in the audience is this 5'10", statuesque, leggy Dutch woman who was dating Marty. And I'm with my girlfriend. But I noticed that. And, uh, uh, you know, that was kind of it for that year. I think that was 1990. Well, I was asked to come back, my Lord. So I came back, but not with my girlfriend. And Simone came back and was not dating Marty. And I do my second thing, by the way, is a quiz show called Second Chance, it invented by one of the uh, women in, in the New Hampshire group. And um, when I'm done, I see her in the audience, I go up, I sit next to her and say, um, well, Simone, nice to see you here. You live in New Jersey, you had to travel at least 300 miles. Uh, how's your year been? And she said, it's been terrific, Rick. Oh, Excuse me, uh, uh, Jimmy Jones, I see him over there. I, I just got to go talk to him. Sorry. And she leaves. I, what's that white tornado in, in the Oval Office, you'll notice, where I've traveled very far. I don't know what's doing that, but I don't just try that. Does that help? No. No. Okay. So um, at any rate, so I've been single for about five years and uh, met a number of uh, lovely ladies who adored language. And so after she she's done with Jimmy Jones, I there's a seat I go over. Well, Simone, um, so how are you enjoying this? Oh, I'm, I'm really having fun. Uh, Sally Smith, so sorry. And she leaves. <laughs> I am not used to that. So at this crucial <laughs> point, as it turned out with us, I said, she's done with Sally Smith. And I said, I'll give it one more try. The power of three, the rule of three. So I go over and sit with her and I said, Simone, I just have a question for you. I'm enjoying your company, but every time we get started, you um, leave for somebody else. And she looks at me and says, Richard, I find you a very attractive man. 
but I don't date married men. I deserve better than that. And I said, but Simone, I'm not. And, and, and she had figured, she knew I had three kids and the woman I was with a year and a half younger than I looked like the right age for that. I said, Simone, I'm not married. She said, you're not married. And I said, no, I'm single. So we talked for about two more hours now that that was taken care of. But I did say I'm still in a relationship, but definitely it's changing with Mary, we'll call her. If that ends, you will hear from me. It did end. We started dating six weeks later. We were engaged. If I had just given up, I would not be with Simone, who incidentally, 45, her first and only marriage at that time. You lose all the points you don't play. The older you get, knock and it shall be open to you if you're not trying to screw somebody over. And more than you can believe, that door will be open. So just something to think about. Well, How long have you been married? Uh, 29 yeah. years this November. And again, her first and only marriage. And I, and I was married to my first wife who passed uh, 24 years. So what happens at the weddings is when they say, okay, uh, all the married couples get up and dance and we dance. Okay, uh, if, you, uh, if you're married less than five years, sit down. 10 years, 15 years, and then Simone will sit down, but I've been married much more. I just keep dancing by myself <laughs> because, um, you know, it's been uh, quite a while, uh, more than 50 years together. But just remember, my friends, that marriage is like a deck of cards. You start off with two hearts and a diamond. Pretty soon you want to grab a club and use a spade. <laughs> Think about that. It's a lovely, what we call quadruple <laughs> homographic pun. There's no change in the writing. They're much harder to do than on the phones. So any questions about writing? Any questions about the books? Any questions about your writing? Any questions about grammar usage? History of the language? Word and phrase origins? Richard, this is Wynn again. I have another question, if I may. Yes, you're so damn shy, and I love it, of course. And then I want to find out, is Vikram in Mensa, or is the child of a Mensa, which could also be true? Uh, and actually, let's start with that. Uh, Vikram, I, can you hear me? I, and I don't know if you're unmuted. Are you in Mensa? Yeah, I'm in Mensa. You're in Mensa. Can you hear me? Man, I'm just your man. It's too echoic. How old is Vikram? Uh, eight? Ten? Vikram mentioned nine. He is in Mensa. He's nine. Great. Hey, Vikram. Glad you're here. Hi. Glad you're here. And I'm glad that you're enjoying this talk. Uh, uh, that's great. I am in Mensa, but not Mensa Firehouse. Hi. Stay here. Stay here. But <laughs> mom is also in Mensa. My mom is in Mensa. Yeah. It tends to be heritable and inheritable at the same time. I collect those against that. Two opposite, seem to be opposite. So My mom is also in Mensa. What? Translate? Mensa. There's Mensa. a lot of noise from somewhere, and I'm not yes, sure. Yes, somebody's. Uh, thing is coming oh, Vikram's, I think it was Vikram making Yeah. Comment. At any rate, Vikram, terrific. So, yes, when? So, as you know, we're living in the socially distant era. Yes. And um, in California, but also especially in San Francisco. When describing, let's say, a social event, you want to set up uh, an event at a, a park, like a picnic, but you want to describe it as observing social distance requirements, what's the best way to describe that event in terms of an adjective? Is it like a hyphenated adjective, like social hyphen distanced, or that, is it socially distant with no Okay, hyphen? my start, when my start would be physical distance. I think social, socially distant is odd. 
uh, physically distant. It's not social at all. And in general, when you have a compound modifier, you would hyphenate it. So for me, it would be uh, physically distance hyphen. Uh, no, no, it wouldn't be with an ally, just physically distant um, or physical distancing uh, is the order of the day. That's the way I would describe it. And uh, for people who don't observe that, one of the new words uh, in there now, first of all, I'm going to show you one of the new words. I don't know how much you can see COVID hair. It doesn't show up much, but I look like uh, Medusa. Um, and um, so, um, but my favorite is Covidious, Covidiacy. And that's a blend that Lewis Carroll would adore. Uh, chortle, uh, Ophrabjus, they kalu kalay, I chortle in my joy. Chortle is um, chuckle and snort. And as you know, he was famous for that. Twas brillig and the slithy toves the gyre and gimbal in the way and Paul Mimsy were the borogoves and the mome wraith out grave. Um, so he would like that. So that would be the best I could do for you. There will be physical distancing and who knows when that's gonna come. You know, it's a little bit like Zeno's paradox and that's the one where the frog is in front of the wall and leaps halfway there, then halfway in the remaining, half of the remaining, never gets to the wall. Now there is a chronological flaw in that, but it seems like, oh, no, more of uh, this, well, the vaccines, but, and so on. If any of you are interested in my etymology of all of the, of the COVID words, plus my um, jokes, uh, my pleasure, just email me and you'll get, get it by attachment. It's called Viral Words. Okay, anything else? My pleasure, I'm yours. No, no questions on they, there, and that kind of thing. I thought that would pique your interest, uh, you know, uh, as a second, third person singular. Well, if you're interested in that one, email me and I'll mail it to you because it's a very interesting set of principles about language. And I will just say here, I have long advocated they, uh, their, them, etc., as a singular and a plural. And what I just will say to you here in part, because we've already done that once, and the word is you, your, yourself, right? It's a second person singular and a second person plural, but it used to be thou, thou shalt not steal, and that means you and you and you and you, one at a time. And then, O ye of little faith, is a bunch of thous. Uh, and uh, so we've already done that once, and now we're doing it again. But actually, Chaucer did it back in about 1380, long time ago. So it's been done. It's not as new as you think. And I should mention that the first AG that Simone and I attended together as husband and wife was in Burlingame. And I think that one, was that 91 or 92? Can anybody help me? Uh, I can't tell Michael if you're speaking, but you're muted. I'm trying to unmute. Um, uh, 92. I believe that was in 92. Boy, and I went to that and I said, oh, now I get what these folks are about. Fabulous. So much fun. So, Richard, talking about they, there's also you and how it seems like in the South, there's you and you all. There sure and is. There's also all you all. That's correct. Which, which is what the plural of you all is all you all. That's a whole bunch of y'alls. Now y'all is theoretically plural and you is singular. But uh, a number of Southerners will say it depends where you are because in some places uh, they are, they use you as a, 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 is also a plural. But usually it's y'all come again and all y'all is a bunch of y'alls. <clears throat> and that's dialects. Remember, standard English is simply a dialect. It's a very useful one. Most books are written in standard English. No, most newscasts are cast, broadcast uh, in standard English. So it's very useful to uh, know standard English. I happen to grow up in an immigrant home that did not speak standard English, but I 
went to the library and I taught it to myself. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, so, uh, and, and we're divided in the dialects, including Philadelphia, where I come from, the hoagie, and you all may call it a po' boy somewhere, uh, a sub, a grinder, depending. I don't know, what do they call it in the San Francisco area? The Italian sandwich, what do they call probably it? Probably a subway. Um, yeah. Okay, well, you sub it anyway. Yeah, you heard about Subway, of course. Sub sandwich. In Ireland, right, where uh, it was deemed by the Irish government that their role was not bread because it exceeded 2% sugar, and in fact, 10% sugar. Um, so we language is a great pie, the slices of which are dialect. When I get back to Philly with my friends, I immediately switch. Uh, and, um, you know, the same thing with so-called Black English, which is elegant, rule-governed, uh, and works in certain situations, and in others, maybe you need to do standard English code switching. That's what makes you good in language. And I think, am I right, from your area, is that the uh, RV, you're, are you Region 8? Yes. And and is the RVC is from your region, Tracy? Yes. Yeah, Tracy. Great. Yeah, give her my best, I don't know her, but... Uh, Great. We really Tracy appreciate Tracy uses that. they, them, theirs pronouns, by the way. She does. Well, is she doing that yes, they do. uh, for the idea of gender? Right? In other words, uh, does That's not correct. want to... They, they, they are a gender non-conforming person. Yeah. Well, I don't know, non-conforming, but, you know, we're generally in this nation moving toward diversity. And if someone does not want to be identified as male or female, but rather they to embrace the neutrality, I welcome that. I think that's more respect for that person. Actually, it's made getting to the bathroom easier as I notice. So now you can use either one. And at my age, uh, I just don't want to be sued for defecation of character. Uh, uh, because it, it happens around this age. And uh, I just arrived at that pun uh, by a process of elimination, but uh, otherwise, there you go. Um, and I've been doing this since I can remember. It's just it's the way I see the world. So I embrace it. And believe me, on a tennis court, I don't think of it at all. It just disappears. It's only when I'm sitting with friends like you. Uh, so at any rate, I'd love to do a comedy night sometime. Uh, if you ever want to do a fundraiser with my books, great. Uh, and as I say, Halloween uh, is, you know, getting pretty near the end of my offering that book. But Christmas, would love to help you out. Meretricious too, or whatever you want to my pun pal, fam, uh, uh, Richard Letter, or that kind of thing. And 13 buckaroos, and you... Uh, it's pretty cheap for a gift, and it's a rich letter or book. You're going to learn a heck of a lot about Christmas. Well, okay, I will give a you the clap. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hope to see you again. And just uh, all I can say is, uh, okay, remember I said I was uh, a polyglot. So to prove it, I'm just going to say to you um, uh, just a minute. Um, our reservoir, Alfina Schnitzel. Uh, let's get Spanish for this part of the world. Hasta Lombago. And in a couple of hours, um, buenas nachos to you. Comments, I want to thank Richard Letterer for being our speaker today and uh, give virtual <laughs> applause.